This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to Tao Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. I'm your host, Ido Aharoni, and today it gives me a great pleasure to interview the legendary professor Itamar Rabinovich, who's not only a former president of Tel Aviv University, but also a former Israeli ambassador uh, to the United States and one of the leading scholars on the Middle East. And of course, I didn't even begin to read your book, Very long list of, of great credentials and great credits. It's such a pleasure to have you with us, Itamar. Thank you very much, uh, Ido, and particularly I'm delighted to be conversing with you, an old friend and professional colleague. Thank you. You know, I've been, I've been observing you with a great admiration over the years, which I think I expressed to you also in person and publicly. And I'm very curious, before we begin with your academic and professional career, because this is the... podcast of Tel Aviv University, and you've been here from almost the beginning. Tell us a bit about, you know, today we see this campus and we take it for granted. You know, what was here when you first came to Tel Aviv University? Um, not much. Um, the, the law faculty, which uh, had been actually passed over from the uh, extension of the Hebrew University, the building of the sciences and the Gilman building, and the administration was in a series of huts, known as the hill. Uh, it was small, simple, but uh, the big advantage was that there was a group of uh, founding fathers who were very dedicated, worked together, about 10 of them, um, in charge of, uh, say, the, the main uh, disciplines in the sciences and the humanities. And without them, the, the place would not have developed the way it did. <clears throat> of course, at the time, There was a great deal of, uh, let's say, jealousy as well as uh, uh, paternalism by the Hebrew University. It was, was not interested in having a, a competitor in uh, Tel Aviv. It's sort of a monopoly, not over higher education because there were Weizmann and Technion, but over sort of university education. The university had to live up to that, uh, you know, contend with that uh, jealousy and uh, paternalism, but... Uh, It did quite well, and uh, in its turn, looked the same way on Haifa, Beersheba. Uh, oh, now, what was your first encounter with Tel Aviv University? I, uh, I, I registered here to get an MA. I had a BA in History and Middle Eastern History from the Hebrew University. I did uh, sort of what they call in America the ROTC, Academic Reserve, called here. I was serving in military intelligence as an analyst. I decided to stay on for a few years. And then I found out that I could actually pursue an MA at Tel Aviv University in history, not in Middle Eastern history. So I registered, uh, became a student, uh, a teaching assistant, and, and then was chosen by the university to be sent abroad to come back with a PhD and join the faculty. And that's when you went to UCLA? Exactly. And you got your PhD. And I think your PhD in, in large was, was based on some information that you were able to collect in Uh, as a result of the Yom Kippur War? Uh, the Six-Day War. The Six-Day, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's an interesting story in, in itself. Uh, I went to, to the Golan Heights a day after they were captured by the IDF in 67. Uh, Conetra was abandoned swiftly by the, uh, by the Syrians. They did not destroy documents. We found the uh, headquarters, the main office of the Ba'ath Party, the ruling party in Syria, And there was a filing cabinet uh, with the sort of archive of the office, put it in the trunk of the car, uh, deposited it at uh, Tel Aviv University. And when the time came to write the PhD, I wrote on the first three years of the bath in power, uh, using to some extent, not just, but uh, to a considerable extent, the uh, circulars and the correspondence that I found in that uh, filing cabinet. So fast forward a few decades later, you were the head of the team that negotiates with the Syrians under its Hakra being the prime minister. Um, how did that feel, you know, to make that tra- trajectory over the years from studying the Syrians all of a sudden to negotiating with them? A unique feeling, a unique feeling. And uh, one thing I learned as a peace negotiator is that Uh, your task as a negotiator 
is not to bring an agreement at, uh, at all costs. You know, your task is to bring or help bring a good agreement if it's available. And it was not when I was the negotiator. So I did not feel frustrated because there was not a, we did not miss an opportunity uh, in, in that regard. And, but the, the prospect of, uh, of making peace with a country that I studied, wrote about, had, I wouldn't say uh, a particular warm relationship to wars, but uh, def definitely a great deal of empathy to, uh, to the people. So before we get to your tremendous experience as a negotiator, let's go back a little bit to the moment that really changed your life, which is your, the meeting with Itzhak Rabin, if you can tell us. I know that you wrote a book about him, which I'd like you to talk about, but also tell us a bit about that. I know it's famous that you played tennis with him, but when was the first time you met with him? It is so famous that it actually never happened. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a headline. Right. This. We never, we never played, uh, we never played tennis uh, together. But we, we had a professional and, and social relationship. I wouldn't call it a friendship. Acquaint more sort of acquaintance, to some extent professional, to some extent social. We, they used to invite us. We used to invite them, and uh, it began when I was a young officer and he was chief of staff, and I was sent to, to brief the chief of staff. In those days, the IDF too was a smaller and more intimate a place, and a lieutenant could be called upon to, to brief the chief of staff. Um, so uh, we, we knew each other, we became friendly, and when he be, was elected for a second uh, term to be, or second opportunity to be prime minister uh, in 1992, uh, he invited me for a meeting. Um, which was a, a, a very unique uh, recruitment experience. And so we sat in. He was not, never uh, great on uh, small talk. So I sat down in his uh, study and he said, uh, the thing that uh, presses me uh, most is I need to replace the chief negotiator with Syria. And he said, can you think of somebody who has some public standing and uh, knows the subject matter. <laughs> well, it was a bit <laughs> it was a bit awkward. I realized that he didn't want to get a negative answer and so he didn't offer it directly. But it was awkward to recommend said, I know yes I, I know myself. So I said, well I know a couple of names maybe and he said, I'm not interested in a couple of names. I said, in that case I'd be very happy to do it. And he smiled and he said, Oh I'm so delighted and uh, there began a, not just a professional relationship, but uh, really a friendship that became quite close uh, in a matter of weeks and months. And um, working with him was a unique privilege. And, and I must say, again, observing you, you were extremely effective as an ambassador uh, in, in, in Washington um, because everybody knew that he trusted you so much. And, yeah, it's, uh, you know, as, as you know from your own service in America, the Americans in general and Washington people in particular uh, are very practical. And Washington wants to know whether the ambassador in Washington is the prime minister's man, the channel to the prime minister. If he or she is, then, you know, fine, we'll work through the ambassador. And if he or she is not, then, you know, you can go to cocktail parties. Now, just out of curiosity, where was the story about the tennis born? Because I've heard it so many times. Well, he was an Navi tennis player and I was an Navi tennis player, but we never played together. So Actually, people... yeah, during, during the years of my tenure, uh, on one occasion I played with Leah, his, uh, his wife, yeah. Okay, so that that was probably the how the story was born. Probably right. some publicist, yeah, whatever, the yeah. creative mind of a publicist. Yeah. So, so you say there was no deal to be made with the Syrians. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with the Israeli-Syrian relations? Because fundamental things have changed since then, right? There was a civil war. There's a complete social and political change in Israel. What do you think is going to happen with that ties? Let me qualify. It. Uh, my earlier statement to some extent. In uh, August 1993, uh, just a few days before Oslo was announced, uh, Rabin uh, had a meeting with Secretary of State Christopher, uh, attended as well by Dennis Ross and myself as note takers. And Christopher came to Israel and he was to go to Syria the next day, and Rabin gave him what is, has since been known as the deposit. Right. 
Um, it was uh, Rabin said to him, tomorrow when you go to Damascus, ask Assad if he gets what he wants, will he give me what I want? This is known as the hypothetical question technique, used sometimes to break a deadlock in negotiation. What was the deadlock? The deadlock was that Assad refused to elaborate on what he means by peace before he gets a commitment to full withdrawal from the Golan. And our position was, you don't begin a negotiation with the bottom line. We don't say it won't happen, but it, you need to get there uh, through a certain route. So it was deadlocked. Rabin was not comfortable with Oslo, and therefore he made a last-ditch effort to see whether a deal could be made with Syria. So he gave Christopher the deposit, willingness to withdraw from the Golan, basically to uh, replicate the deal that Menachem Begin had, had made with uh, Sadat. And then he said to him two things. First of all, this is very secretive, and if, if it comes out, it doesn't exist. And secondly, he said, it's in your pocket. Don't put it on the table. And unfortunately, Christopher did put it on the table, and Assad immediately began the uh, haggling. Uh, Rabin said withdrawal in five years. He said six months. Rabin said he wanted security regime in the Golan. He said, no, we are the victim. We are not the aggressor. The Israelis are the aggressor, blah, blah, blah. So when Christopher came back and he said, Assad agrees, but Rabin understood that there was no swift way to, uh, to do it. On top of that, he asked Christopher, so how long are you staying in the region? And Christopher said to Rabin, oh, we are leaving tonight. It's August. It's vacation time. So Rabin went to Oslo. So he, he understood yeah. that now, this was not a top priority. Yeah, for the present, it's, it's, it's not a viable option. I, you know, I... I I won't make a prediction for the next 20 years, but right now and for the immediate future, it's not on the table. To begin with, Syria is not a real state now. Uh, it's a failed state. Uh, Assad controls maybe 60% of his country. He's under the boot of the Russians and the Iranians. And he, you know, he's a, a mass murderer. The Israeli public, against withdrawal from the Golan in any event, would not allow an Israeli government to give back the Golan or most of it to a mass murder. So now uh, I must ask you a question about this because um, I've heard it from several people. Do you remember 2013 President then Barack Obama makes a promise, a public promise, that if it will be proven to him that Assad used chemical weapons against his own people, that's a red line as far as America is concerned, is there going to be military repercussions? And then of course when it's proven to him, he didn't really do it. Do you think that was a, a a milestone in when you see what's happening today in our region, including Russia, Ukraine? Do you think that has any impact? Undoubtedly. Uh, actually, uh, I, I published a book that I co-authored with a colleague uh, in 2020 uh, called uh, Syrian Requiem on the Syrian Civil War. It is now being published uh, on paperback, and I, I suggested to the publisher that they advertise it as prelude to Ukraine. Uh, because uh, many of the things that you see in, uh, in Ukraine, in the Ukraine war now, uh, are either comparable to what the Russians did in Syria or even derived to some extent. And the sense that uh, America will, uh, will not fight to, uh, to protect its allies and its interests in, in the Middle East uh, was was very much in, uh, embedded uh, by uh, Obama's uh, failure to meet his own uh, red line in 20, 2013. It was a, a defining moment. And and do you think that the fact that Putin invaded Crimea in 2014 was related to that? Yes, when he sort of calculated uh, what, what was going to be the response of, of the West, he uh, probably took took that uh, failure to act in 2013 uh, as, as sort of one of the uh, factors in the equation. Now, obviously, we would like to recommend the book to our listeners and our viewers. So if you can tell us a bit about the book Requiem to Syria. Re Pearl. Syrian Requiem. It's co-authored by uh, Karmit Balenci, who is a researcher in the INSS, the uh, Tel Aviv University-affiliated uh, think tank, and myself. It was a study of the civil war itself and its sequels. And the sequels call it Requiem because, unfortunately, Syria, as it had existed prior to the civil war, doesn't exist anymore. For instance, 
a large part of the Syrian intelligentsia lives outside Syria. There's more Syrian artistic and cultural life in Europe today than there is in Syria. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I, I should maybe emphasize that to a large extent the book derives on interviews with members of the Syrian opposition who were very open to us. And uh, also, unlike earlier books that, uh, that I wrote, it was to a great extent based on social media because much of the civil war could be covered through the social media uh, emails and tweets with members of the opposition who uh, were tweeting with uh, external people who lived outside Syria. So not the usual uh, sources for a book on Middle Eastern politics. So let's talk a little bit about the United States and, and, and Israel, but first about what's happening in the United States. Now, you have a very unique perspective because you were also a diplomat in America, not only uh, a researcher and then a professor at NYU for 11 years, um, and um, in addition to the fact that you traveled to America countless times. So we see the rise of this coalition of minorities. Uh, the American system is um, giving a built-in advantage to the heartland, as we call it, uh, but that, that doesn't really tell the real story. The story is that there's a, a new coalition rising of minorities, the African-Americans, the, the Latinos, the, the Asians, the, the gay community. They no longer view the Jewish community to be part of their coalition. We see that every day. We get more and more evidence. To, the Jews are being associated with, with what they call white privilege, and there are many historical reasons for it. Uh, do you feel that we are sensitive enough here in Israel to what's happening over there? Sensitive, but not uh, sensitive enough. I mean, uh, efforts have been made for, let's say, decades now, 20, 30 years. Uh, there was Project uh, Interchange of the American, uh, derived, uh, actually begin, began with them, AJC, and other efforts to bring here uh, black leaders, uh, Hispanic leaders, uh, Asian American leaders. Uh, an effort has been made, but uh, not sufficiently, and I think it's it's not too not too soon and not too late uh, for the state of Israel and the organized Jewish community uh, to invest that uh, effort. But you know, when when it comes to uh, images, it's very difficult to to change images, and the image of of the American Jew in the eyes of minorities of a very successful member the members of the establishment and to persuade them that uh, they are on the same footing as uh, other ethnic uh, minorities or hyphenated Americans is very difficult. So the American community, the organized community, is a victim of the success of American individuals, basically. That's, yeah. that's what yeah. we're looking at. Rightly so. And, and the political changes that are, we see that, um, the, and we are now talking after the midterm elections in the United States, the expectation, which was... Um, Across the board, really, I was exposed to CNN and Fox News, and I heard them both cultivating the, the narrative that we're expecting a major red wave. It didn't happen. And uh, the question is, why it didn't happen, and what would be the impact of this, again, on U.S.-Israel yeah. ties? Okay. First, the actually, there's uh, soon enough there won't be a white majority in, uh, in America. There's going to be... Uh, an ethnic uh, or majority of, of minorities. Um, second, the, the, the uh, Trump rode high uh, on that very fact and his ability to cultivate the fears of mostly lower middle class and blue collar white uh, workers or employees that they were going to lose their, uh, their position. This is to, to a large extent his quote unquote base. Um, there was an expectation that this base and the Republican agility or uh, de uh, dexterity in uh, engineering uh, the, the constituencies through the state legislatures has given them a uh, sizable uh, advantage. And therefore, there was a feeling that uh, uh, there would be a quote unquote a red wave in the American elections. It turned out that it was not. Uh, in my view, the main, uh, the main explanation for that comes from the Supreme Court de decision on, uh, on abortion. It affected many, it affected mostly women, but not, not just them, and therefore it was a, a pyrrhic victory. I mean, yes, they got a, a Supreme Court um, 
in their image, but that Supreme Court has scored a self-goal. And, and that obviously is something that is going to stay with us, right? So, so um, as long as the Supreme Court remains in its current configuration, it's actually not going to work in, to the benefit uh, uh, of... Unless the, the judges themselves understand that they have to restrain themselves if they want to serve the larger ideology uh, that they believe in. And, of course, much will depend uh, on who the candidates are. I mean, now Biden feels reinforced. He may or may not be a strong candidate two years down uh, down the road. And it's an open question as to uh, who the Republicans will choose and who the Democrats will choose. So now, it's... as a longtime observer of the American system, are you concerned about the state of American democracy? Uh, I am. I was more so uh, on the eve of these elections because it's uh, said the Trumpist uh, wave challenge the very foundations of democracy. The most important uh, element is transition of power. Uh, democracy is based on the fact that every so often the government changes hands. And Trump tried uh, to deny uh, the victory of his opponent and tried to stage on January 6, basically a, a, a coup. Uh, and he was trying to promote election deniers uh, for to be state officials in charge of the next uh, election. So it was an open offensive against American democracy. And the question is whether the system would be able to defend itself or not, I thought was the most important question on the international agenda because the future of American democracy very much is the future of democracy around the world, given that democracy is on the defensive in Europe, in Latin America, and, and so forth. And uh, therefore, the, uh, uh, the ability of the Democrats to regroup and to uh, check the red wave uh, was an important moment, not just domestically in America, but globally. Now, transitioning the, the, this discussion and your observation from the United States to, to Israel, I, I just came from the United States where people express, expressed those deep concerns about Israeli democracy. They're concerned about what will happen due to the fact that there's some elements in the new, what's going to be the new coalition, that openly, openly said that they're interested in undermining Israeli institutions. Uh, part and parcel with what we call Israelism in Hebrew, mamlachtiut, statism. Um, what is your view of this? Do you, do you, are you also concerned about Israeli democracy? I am concerned. I'm not pessimistic, but I'm concerned. I think that... Uh... Um, the, the, first of all, the uh, what you call the uh, the guardians, the authorities, the judges, the people in the legal system, uh, regulators uh, should should fight back if there are efforts to uh, undermine them, and public opinion should uh, should mobilize itself if uh, some of these uh, threats quite quite openly made. For instance, the attack of uh, Mr. Smotrich on the security service and the absurd uh, charge by him that the security service uh, provoked uh, Robin's assassination. Uh, you know, it's unacceptable. Uh, but, you know, every fact has a counterfact, and uh, normally history unfolds in dialectical ways, and I'm sure that there will be a, a sort of a counter wave. Now, Knowing you and your incredible level of energy, you must be planning your next project already. So what's, what's in, the, in the pipeline for you? Well, I, I finished a book. Uh, it's called um, Middle Eastern Maze, Israel, the Arabs, and the Region, 1948-2022. It will be published by uh, Brookings at the end of January. The next project is to promote this, this book for... Uh, well, I think you came to the right place. Uh, one we, of them. <laughs> we we are we are helping. Yeah. We are very happy to help you promote your books, and uh, it's an opportunity also to express gratitude on behalf of all of us for everything that you've done for this university and for the state of Israel in general. Thank you very much. It's yeah. a pleasure to have you, and I'm sure it's not the last time we we are meeting here in this podcast studio. Thank you so much, Professor Robinovich. My, my pleasure, Edo. See you soon. And to you, our listeners and viewers, um, I can't wait until our next episode. Bye bye. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. 
Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Thank you.